thanks everyone for joining. Um, for those of you who were at our first talk back in April, uh, welcome back. Thanks for turning in again. There will be a fair amount of repetition, I warn you. Uh, I hope you still find it interesting. Um, so please forgive me for that. But it does cover a lot of really important uh, research focus and ideas and concept development that are relevant to today's presentation. For those of you listening who did not join that talk, I really strongly uh, suggest that you do listen to it. It's available on YouTube. The former program manager, Maya Gudahus, and I went in to detail about SPP's introduction, its beginnings, and um, so it's really interesting to get a sense of the project. Uh, this round, I intend to go into a bit more detail about the research activities and, um, and the community engagement project, sharing what we've done so far, and uh, but particularly what we have planned ahead. Of course, with COVID, um, most of our projects have been put on hold. So I do hope to be back at the lodge in September. Let's see. Oh. Okay, got my laser pointer. So just first to uh, orient ourselves, this is where we are. Uh, the Dzanga Sangha Forest Reserve is uh, located in the southwestern tip of the Central African Republic and spans nearly 7,000 square kilometers. Um, it's part of a tri-national network of protected areas which neighbors, uh, neighboring Cameroon and the Republic of Congo and is managed by WWF and the ministry, the government ministry of water and forests. The biodiversity of, of the Dzanga Sangha Forest Reserve is quite staggering and is home to high concentrations of endangered species, including pangolins. The, the research conducted in the reserve from forest elephants to lowland uh, gorillas really advances our, our understanding of these species and this ecosystem. And, um, and the tourism generated here provides jobs and supports the local economy. Zanga Sangha is also home to uh, a number of indigenous groups, including the Baka forest people and the Sangha Sangha people, and uh, whose existence is inextricable. Uh, the forest is inextricable to their culture, identity, and survival. So most of you, I, I, I would presume, are familiar with pangolins. So I won't go into too much detail about them, but I will, as a brief background, tell you that um, these are termites and ant-eating mammals covered in uh, overlapping scales made of keratin, which make them quite distinct and fascinating. Uh, there are a total of eight species in Asia and Africa, four of which are in Africa. And three of those occur in the Dzanga Sangha forests. And that's the white-bellied pangolin, the black-bellied pangolin, and the giant, the elusive giant pangolin. Uh, as most of you know, uh, pangolins face numerous threats, but the most significant is the overexploitation for consumption of their meat and the use of their scales in traditional medicines. Now, despite there being an international ban on the commercial trade, the illegal trafficking, the illegal trade persists, and they are considered to be one of the most trafficked mammals in the world. In fact, both the white-bellied pangolin and uh, the giant pangolin have recently been moved up from vulnerable to endangered. So um, I won't spend, this isn't about the illegal trade, which I could talk about for hours, as Rod knows from, from speaking with clients at the lodge. Um, I do just want to focus on the fact that the, to simply highlight that there is an urgent need to increase, to improve protections of pangolins and give a particular focus on addressing the rise of transcontinental trafficking of African pangolins destined for Asian markets. So this is our team. I think you'll recognize that bearded man is Rod and his wife, Tam. They started the lodge in 2009 and have since uh, formed SPP as a passion project where they have been uh, rescuing pangolins, rehabilitating them, and soft releasing them into the surrounding forest. Then came Maya Gudehus, a Swiss veterinarian who officially registered the project in 2017 and, um, and has been really at the, at the core of developing the project into what it is today. 
Then of course, there are the trackers and the volunteers. That's uh, Julie and Birgit standing with uh, team leaders Como and Likemo on the left-hand side, Sulali and Mandende, who are trackers who uh, are involved in the research and the monitoring of the released black-bellied pangolins in the, the surrounding forest. And on the right is uh, Pedro, who's actually an eco-guide, but who has sort of become an unofficial and really critical part of the research team, uh, volunteer for SPP. I myself joined as a volunteer, as Rod has mentioned, and apparently um, Rod and Tam decided that I'm good enough to stick around. So I'm now really focusing on the research and community activities for the project. So there are, uh, these are the core areas of SPP's activities. So uh, there are many, and despite being a small project, there really are a small team, there are quite a number of projects that we are juggling. But um, the research and publication has been ongoing um, with, with uh, a monitoring of black-bellied pangolins that have been rehabilitated and released into the surrounding forest. So through this research, we are able to uh, contribute to a growing understanding of ecology and behavior of, of this particular species, uh, including the, their home ranges, their prey selection, tree preference, and uh, currently a survey that will hopefully estimate pangolin oc occupancy in the Sango Lodge concession. And there's of course the illegal scale trade that is present in the area and I've been analyzing scale seizures to hopefully understand the impact on the local populations here to start really collecting baseline information on trends and understanding offtake which I'll go into more detail. Then uh, there's also DNA analysis, as PP has been um, actively providing samples which are being used for genetic analysis, for understanding disease, uh, genetic mapping, and some really exciting uh, uh, research on pangolin microbiomes. And of course, uh, there's also veterinary, veterinary aspects and parasitology through a necropsy. Um, they were able to, I was not involved in this, but to discover a new parasite species, which was very exciting. And, um, but SPP at its core has been, uh, at least at the beginning of rehabilitation and, and veterinary cl clinics. So uh, focusing on the intake of pangolins that have been rescued either from the bushmeat trade or now more and more from the pet trade, which seems to be on the rise in Bangui. Um, then of course there is uh, the knowledge that we gain from from having these uh, rehabilitating these pangolins and releasing them and being able to observe them. But pangolins are notoriously difficult to keep in captivity. And the 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 knowledge that that the SPP team has acquired from 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 rehabilitating these pangolins has really helped understand their dietary habitat needs and uh, hopefully to improve these uh, the rehabilitation throughout, not just in Central Africa, but in the world. Now, a subject that I feel particularly uh, enthusiastic about are SPP's community uh, engagement activities. So that starts from just to run through, but the local employment. So of course, there's a team of BACA trackers who are from the local villages who have been working for SPP, uh, contributing to the research monitoring the released pangolins uh, and they really form a core part of SPP's research activities, exchanging uh, their local knowledge and understanding of the forest. Then there is the awareness campaign, which SPP launched earlier uh, in 2019 with the primary focus of raising awareness of SPP's work in the local, throughout the local communities also communicating the threats and why they are receiving protection. And then I hope to end on the note of this pangolin, community pangolin monitoring project, which those of you who attended the first talk um, might remember me alluding to. And this is something um, which I, is close to my heart as it really is focused on engaging local communities to become, to participate and benefit from our research activities. So I also want to highlight another aspect of SPP's that, that doesn't get as much attention, but I think is really quite special. And um, that is 
that offer that Sangha Lodge offers a series of activities for its guests, uh, a series of tourist activities. Um, and one of those, while it is not technically a tourism activity, but more so an opportunity for anyone interested, um, is are these guided visits to see the pangolins that are currently being monitored. And essentially a, a small group of guests will go into the forest along with a researcher and with the Baca trackers just to learn about pangolins and the research that we're conducting. Of course, this is, this is uh, acknowledging the fact that almost nowhere in the, else in the world can you go out into the forest and guarantee to see a pangolin. And so the idea is really to share that privilege with, with uh, the guests who are staying at the lodge. This is actually a video recorded by one of the guests who was absolutely thrilled to see a pangolin for the first time. Koki is a black-bellied pangolin who we're monitoring every day and who really is the star of our research. Here she's just woken up from a nap and does a little taste test of the air around her. Um, which I always like watching. So these guided walks um, are a great opportunity also just for the Baca trackers themselves to, to participate and interact with, with the guests, to answer questions and to be a part of that research process as well as practicing their English, which they never miss an opportunity to do. Um, moving on to the ecological, the latest in our ecological research is, uh, is actually a survey, which we launched at the beginning of this year, which has been temporarily interrupted. But, um, but it's, it was launched to gather baseline data on pangolins in the uh, concession area surrounding the lodge in an effort to really assess occupancy and to start, to start studying changes over time. The study, of course, relies heavily on the ecological knowledge of the trackers. And so it was designed to complement their movements in the forest, which of course are not linear, can't exactly point A to point B on a straight line in the dense canopy in the dense forest doesn't work as well as just following a baka who can, who can move quite, quite well compared to me, for example. Um, and so because there's a lot of space to, to cover, uh, we were targeted with our approach and took advantage of the walking trails surrounding the lodge and used a combination of method, method, methods relying on the ecological knowledge of the trackers to set camera traps. And actually there is a study that recently came out by a team in Cameroon that does exactly this, a very similar methodology, but that um, explores how using local ecological knowledge can help detection efforts of pangolins. And this was in the Deng Deng uh, National Park of Cameroon. I've attached this into the reference list at the end of the presentation. So anyone who's interested, it's, it's a fascinating study. So pangolins are ant and termite eaters, and they use their claws to dig and lift bark from trees, which makes uh, feeding signs one of the best ways to detect presence. And here Likemo and Tam are discussing a, a particular feeding sign where he's able to tell us the name of the tree, whether the sign is old or fresh, and even sometimes the name of the ant or termite species the pangolin was, was after. Baca are excellent tree climbers, and here Likemo is setting up an arboreal camera trap facing what we thought was a good looking hole, tree hole, which might be used by a pangolin as a sleeping site. Thanks, Likemo. And just to share some of our findings from the first phase of this survey, the last time, the first presentation, I showed you some camera trap footage. This time, I'd like to get you a nice visual of the transects themselves. And, um, and so, as I said, here we are. Taking advantage of these are the walking trails stemming from Sangha Lodge. We then, uh, we then uh, created these, conducted these transects of a total of four. And here each of those dots is a GPS point of a recorded pangolin feeding sign. So that's uh, over 300 feeding signs that have been detected during those, those uh, transect walks. And um, 
very excitingly, one pangolin sighting during a nocturnal walk. And for now, a total of seven captures from our camera traps of white-bellied pangolins. So this is really promising, and uh, we're really looking forward to the second phase of the survey, which will be targeting giant pangolins, the elusive giant pangolin. And here is something I find particularly cool. Um, given that white-bellied pangolins are nocturnal and therefore it makes them extremely difficult to observe uh, when they're active, we decided to invest in a thermal vision scope. Uh, this here is Penge. So before I start the video, I just want to note something. Uh, this is actually a white-bellied pangolin that is currently under intense care at the lodge. Um, who was confiscated from, by eco-guards from poachers. And he came in with a severe head injury, so he's a bit wobbly, but he's made a remarkable comeback. And actually, through observing him through the vision scope, we were able to see something pretty cool, pointed out by Alon Cassidy. That right there. Now, that could be a trace of urine, a trace of feces, is it potentially scent marking? Either way, it's the first time that we've been able to observe that nocturnally through the, the thermal vision. So it really gives you uh, an idea of the enormous potential that um, thermal vision offers for studying and observing nocturnal species. Now, anyone who knows me here knows that I'm all about pangolin scales. I kind of lose the plot. And so when I discovered that SPP had a, had a plastic bag full of scales that had been abandoned on the side of the road, I, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist. And although the scales are in a pretty bad condition because actually a fungus seems to have taken over, um, I was able to, this presented an opportunity to analyze the scales belonging to presumably one pangolin. So here is a reconstruction of those scales, uh, which I then counted and weighed. So why do this? <laughs> while all, well, basically, while all um, pangolins have scales, not all scales are the same. And there's significant variation in the number of scales, their weight, and, and the size. So this is why we need species-specific parameters if we're going to accurately estimate the number of individuals represented in those massive scales that you hear about, which can often feel like abstract, an abstract process. For example, here, uh, we have uh, two bags full of scales. Now these are, these are scales that were seized by eco guards in DSPA. And um, when, this is a total of 70 kilos in the end. And when looking at these scales, it becomes a bit difficult to understand well, how many pangolins does that represent? What does the scale, what is the impact of the scale trade on local populations? So, so I was given access to the seizure. Oh, something keeps popping up this time. Uh, I was given access to the seizure and um, was able to to conduct some sampling work. Now I took a series of samples rather than counting and sorting and weighing every single scale in the seizure, which would be a, a bit crazy. We were able to take um, samples. So here in this image is one kilo sample of scales, which were then counted, sorted, by, identified by species and weighed. And that data is very useful to us. And um, here is just to give you a visual of what that means, which is that now analyzing the scales and the morphometrics of those scales, you can get a sense of the, the differences across the three species. And this is this data that I'm about to share is uh, specifically from the seizure that I analyze. And so with these kinds of, of data points that we have, so the average number of scales and the, we were able to derive the average weight of a single scale. And you can see that a giant pang the average weight of a giant pangolin scale is 4.2 grams versus 0.3 grams of a white-bellied pangolin. So you can see why it does become important to understand uh, the differences, the variation, and how we can, the sampling methods can be specific to the species in question. And once, once we know the species composition, we can then calculate uh, very, very accurately the number of individual pangolins in a seizure. So here, for example, in the 70 kilogram seizure, 
we were able to, by using the two sampling methods that are currently available to us, understand how many white-bellied pangolins, black-bellied pangolins, and giant pangolins were in that seizure. As you can see, it, uh, it contains a majority of white-bellied pangolins, which are considered the more common species in the area, but not for long at this rate. And, um, and at, in the end, uh, we are able to understand the total number of pangolins, uh, which ranges between 287 to 323 in that 170 kilo seizure. Oh yes, and, and just on another note, uh, we are actually working, um, currently teaming up with a, a team of colleagues in Côte d'Ivoire to compare sampling methods for estimating the number of individuals in seizure scales. So again, why is this important? Uh, understanding the species composition of scale seizures helps us understand the impact of scale trafficking on African pangolins. Um, in the absence of robust population estimates in the wild, because pangolins are very difficult to find, uh, in the wild and to study, scale seizures provide us with a window into the quantity of offtake, which is of course a fraction of what is actually being uh, shipped and leaving the country. Now we move on to our community side of, of, of SPP's activities. Um, this map here shows us the villages of DSPA and outside of DSPA. And uh, in 2019, I mentioned that SPP launched an awareness campaign visited, where we visited a total of 12 villages. Um, these visits have been an essential component of SPP's work, not only uh, as an opportunity for us to raise an awareness among the local communities on, on our work, who we are, and why pangolins are receiving protection but also for us uh, to understand perceptions and attitudes and for us to be able to understand how we can tailor our message, messaging to be specific and which, which uh, the values or the perceptions differ greatly from one village to the next, from one ethnic group to the next. So being able to communicate and understand these perceptions makes uh, the awareness campaign a really great way to interact with the local communities. And, um, with us on these on these visits are uh, uh, here is Como. He's one of our team leaders, and he's Baaka from a, a village called Musapula. And um, he serves him and Likemo serve as ambassadors, uh, as being Baaka trackers for the SPP. They serve as ambassadors to these local villages for them to really see uh, Baaka working on pangolin conservation. With us is also an interpreter, Armand, who is not Baka, he's Bantu, but he speaks, um, he's multilingual and he's been not only an interpreter, but, but really um, an essential component of, of, oh, sorry, I skipped here. But yeah, I, I do want to spend a moment to highlight Armand because he has really been um, a, an important part of my experience at SPP. You know, with through conversations with him, through discussions, his insights and his enthusiasm, he's really encouraged uh, me to pursue uh, the next phase of what I think SPP's community work will be. And um, just to spend a little time here, this is a, a photo from 2012, and which shows a Baka woman holding a black-bellied pangolin, which was caught during a traditional net hunt. Now, while you might not see this anymore, uh, now that pangolins are receiving more attention, mainly thanks to us because of our awareness campaign, um, although I have been offered my share of pangolins when I come to visit, uh, it is important to understand that Baka and other ethnic groups in the area do eat pangolin meat. Um, wild protein is an important part of their diet. So our awareness campaign has never meant to, to change consumption behavior. After all, the offtake from subsist, subsistence and traditional hunting has never posed a significant threat to pangolin populations. Uh, instead, our objective really is to highlight why the commercial scale trade in particular poses such a threat. And there is a growing presence of the scale trade in, in these local communities. And uh, from what we now understand is that the driver of participation is pretty clear, that pangolin scales now have a value. 
uh, Baca have no traditional use for pangolin scales, and uh, we haven't seen any reports of traditional use throughout the country, which is different to neighbors in, for example, in Congo or DRC, where pangolin scales are indeed used locally in traditional medicines. But um, Baca traditionally have always eaten the meat and discarded the scales. So what has happened is that now with the growing demand of scales uh, internationally, this has brought the illegal trade here. And what used to have no value and was discarded now has a monetary value as traders are approaching Baca hunters and others to, to fetch them pangolin scales. So this is why action is needed. Uh, proactive action is needed because the scale trade in DSPA and um, uh, is is comparatively small than its neighboring countries and um, but that's only for now and it, the idea now for a community engagement project is in part to provide to provide an alternative for participating in that illegal trade so those of you who had heard my previous talk I keep referencing it uh, but know the story of how this idea for a community pangolin monitoring project began and I'm happy to report that since then, I was actually able to secure funding. So whenever it is possible to come back, I hope in the fall, um, we will start to launch this project. And this particular photo shows Armand in the middle with the white shirt, surrounded by a group of Baca from a village which has really served as a pilot for the potential of, of a monitoring of a community project. And in its simplest form, CPMP, that's the acronym Community Pangolin Monitoring Project, we love acronyms, um, is, is an exchange. It's a platform of exchange. Rather, avoiding it being a purely extractive process where we are collecting data and then taking that data with us and then publishing it and off it goes into a scientific journal. This is a way to create uh, an opportunity of exchange where, where the Baca groups in these villages who are going out into the forest every day are able to present us with the data that they collect on the observations that they're making in the forest in exchange for what they feel is something worth their while. And um, that is, is, is going to require visiting, um, consulting each village, but the, in, 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 in uh, basically it would be in exchange for some food goods, so it could be in the form of coffee or sugar or cocoa, some other food staples, um, that, that, or perhaps even soap. And this is what it's going to take, a, there's going to require a consultation project. But for now in Kunda Papai, the model is identifying two pangolin ambassadors per village who serve as a point of contact and as the central points of, of information collection. So they'll be the ones taking the notes and they'll be the ones that are receiving the data. And the idea is then that those two individuals receive a small amount um, of compensation, a bonus for their participation. So it's in part good ex goods exchange and also a small cash incentive. And um, a lot of thought process went into this and a lot of consultation with people working locally on community, on, uh, community engagement. And this seems to be uh, an opportunity to, to, to really engage these villages. So here is an image of me holding a notebook that is full of handwritten notes by one particular group that were going into the forest and diligent notes on, on their observations, including the species of pangolin, the tree that they saw it in, the time of day. And we were visiting um, almost twice a month just to, to, to show them that we are very interested and there's great enthusiasm. In fact, we had been visiting uh, recently before I left, um, conducting some basic training on how to rego record observational data. And uh, eventually we hope to enter the forest with them to start taking GPS points of, of these observations. So CPMP is an initiative that I hope reflects what I think conservation should look like, which goes beyond the fortress model. And where essentially those living closest to the wildlife and wild spaces uh, being protected are included and uh, seeing and benefiting from those activities. 
Protected areas are, of course, an important part of conservation and securing them is necessary, but the approach is inherently exclusionary. So conservation has historically failed indigenous lo and local communities. Uh, there is plenty of evidence of that. And there is growing recognition that conservation must put people at its center if it really has any hope, particularly the people who understand and live intimately with those spaces. So through prior consultation with each village who decides on a community protocol process where expectations um, where, where every, each party communicates their expectations and motivations, the CPNP core goals are the following, and that is to engage and motivate local participation in, in conservation, to rebuild trust, if, if we can put that as a long-term goal in conservation through inclusion, where they are directly seeing the benefits of participation. participation. It's also to build resilience to the growing threat of, of the illegal scale trade, and from an ecological point of view, it's for us to better understand pangolin distribution in the area. So SPP is, of course, a small research project, and there are some really impressive community engagement uh, pro uh, projects throughout the world. Ours really is to build on the momentum that we've achieved with the awareness and the, the, the relationship that we've been building with the local communities. Um, there are, of course, other actors in the reserve working towards community um, Similar goals, WWF, who manages the park, who manages the reserve, has a community development focus. And there's a fantastic nonprofit called Jinkita Wildlife, who work closely with local communities and who have really been um, uh, an excellent resource for understanding, um, for, for the concept development and design of this project. So I just want to, to close by saying that this CPMP is a proactive effort, really. Uh, our, our objective is to be inclusive, to provide an opportunity to villi for villages to share their knowledge. And if we are going to compete with the scale trade, people must be incentivized. And we've seen great enthusiasm from some of the villages. And while this mod model might not work everywhere, we are hopeful that it is the start of community Baca driven uh, research on pangolins in the area. The Baca go into the forest every day. So there is a wealth of information that they have, which given the right opportunity and approach we can access. They participate in our pangolin monitoring efforts. We gain valuable ecological data and they are a part of our research activities, becoming community scientists, so to speak. We have only to gain from working with the Baca and we are trying to seize the opportunity while they are still willing to share their incredible knowledge of their home. So I just want to provide some resources uh, that was the, the study that I referenced before, but the following Excites Research Group and People Now Poaching are two initiatives that have been really at the center of, of, of developing this, this idea and its execution. And I would encourage anyone who is interested in, in participatory and, and local community conservation to, to visit these groups. Of course, here is our social media and you can follow us, uh, our, 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 you can follow our work here. Uh, yes, my question is, um, I'd, um, I'd like to understand a little better why there are so many white-bellied pangolins um, uh, being caught uh, as compared to black-bellied and, well, uh, uh, the, the, the giant pangolins we know are, are uh, scarce, but um, is it because they're nocturnal um, and also, you know, being, being nocturnal, um, how do they actually get picked up by the poachers or by, by, the, by the hunters? Tessa, we uh, that, Tessa, mute you. Sorry, Tessa. There you are. Thanks, thanks for that, Katerina. Yes, it's in part because they're nocturnal. Now, um, the difference between white-bellied and black-bellied pangolins is, of course, that um, black-bellied pangolins are entirely arboreal. They descend to the ground very rarely. Um, and white-bellied pangolins instead spend about half and half of their time. So in, just as a, as a matter of access, they're easier to pick up when they're on the ground. Now, being nocturnal, a lot of the illegal hunting, a lot of the poaching does happen at night. 
So um, pangolins tend to freeze in place when a light is shined at them, which is a technique used not just for pangolins, but other nocturnal animals to stun them. And, um, and these are two big reasons that we think that wide-bellied pangolins are being more targeted. Uh, it, it could be that there are, there are simply bigger populations of wide-bellied pangolins as well, but we of course can't know that for sure until we get those estimates. Thank you. Um, In my opinion, I, Katrina, it's because the, uh, the white-bellied pangolins are totally on the ground and they get caught in traps. That is the, the biggest thing. A lot of the animals we got were, were definitely caught in traps. Thank you, uh, Rod. Um, I see there's a uh, next question here by uh, Catherine Ritchie. Can we unmute you, uh, Catherine? Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Tessa. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, you know that we're a, a keen follower of your work and everything that's been done at Sanger Lodge and the Sanger Project. Um, I'm just really curious to know about whether you have sighted uh, a giant pangolin um, in the area. I always associated the black belly little guys with, with, with Sanger Lodge, probably because that's what Bruce captured on camera <laughs> and now I have the pangolin. But um, I'm just keen to know about other species that you've spotted there, specifically if you've seen a giant pangolin. Thank you. Not yet. <laughs> We are hoping to, though, with, um, uh, I mentioned the second phase of, of uh, the, the survey that we're conducting based on uh, the trackers we work with, and they, they know where the giant pangolins are. So the idea is to go out and set some camera traps by burrows and, and hopefully we'll have a sighting. Um, I do know that there's a group in Ozala that they, they uh, conducted a massive camera trap survey and they actually caught a giant pangolin just a couple of weeks ago on camera, or maybe even last week on camera. So that was very exciting. So they're definitely out there. They're just quite cryptic, but we'll definitely be putting that on our social media the moment it happens. Thank you. Um, next question, Angus Big. Hey Angus. Angus. Angus, good to see you, my friend. Hi, great How's to join us finally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask. I mean, I've I've been as 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 Rod knows since he started this project. It's been like it's most amazing place I've never been to, sort of thing. So I've followed it really um, closely, and. I wanted to check on um, security. At one stage, I think, didn't you have some security guards, Israeli security guards around there, Rod? Rod. You're asking me. <laughs> Whichever one of you guys go. <laughs> uh, okay, this is Sangha Pangolin Project. You want to talk about Sangha Lodge, we talk, it's a different conversation. Um, yeah, yeah okay. it's, um, it's um, yeah. Look, the situation in Central Africa has always been tenuous, uh, it, you know, and it's, I mean, ever since I've been going there, 2004. But our corner of the country is really way down in the south, out of, out of all, all um, it, it's like a peninsula, it's like an island. It's, you know, 30 kilometers to the east, west, and south of us is Congo and Cameroon. Yeah, no, um, but no, what I was actually asking for when I, I mean about security, though, is in, in the sense of poaching, um, and, and Tessa, this is, I mean, obviously you all know this as well. Are there any sort of rangers or guides who are um, basically just, you know, monitoring, watching for poaching activity? Um, I, uh, <laughs> Tessa, do you want me to answer this again? I'll just mention that the, the eco guards that are employed yeah. Um, by the DSPA do, uh, do conduct patrols, and that includes the Sangha Lodge concession, which is massive. It's a lot of area to cover. I think there's, correct me if I'm wrong, Rod, I think there's about 60 or 70 eco guards to span 7,000 square kilometers, so it is um, never-ending work. And um, in terms of the poaching, there's certainly a lot of activity um, throughout the concession, our concession, well, not mine, but Rod and Tam's concession, um, and elsewhere. So yeah, Rod, you can take over. It is called, it is, they, you know, it's, it, it, to, just to clarify here, eco guards are rangers. The 
it's just what they called in Central and West Africa, in a lot of the Francophone countries, they're called eco gods, uh, god, gods of the ecology. And so it's a literal translation. Um, so, but there are rangers we, in East Africa or South Africa, you call them rangers. So we do have rangers, but we don't have enough, and that's why we're trying to. We, we, we're trying to put together a plan to raise money to form an, an NGO, to raise money to, to put more in to protect our specific area so we have a safe haven for specifically pangolins. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Rob. Um, our first speaker, uh, Heerlen, and then Dave Pepler, I think you can ask your question in the chat after Diki. If you can just unmute, please, uh, Marita. I don't see. Uh, at the moment, are oh, they, they in? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, good. I, I'm uh, I'm the husband of Dicke. Uh, I'm husband <laughs> for International Fund of for Animal Welfare and Conservation, I should say. Um, so very interested in your talk. Um, just a little question because it's the everlasting question: How do you make it sustainable? Uh, you talk, were talking about incentives. Luckily, you didn't talk about salary or anything like that. So you are aware of the problems, but I'm very curious how you, uh, yeah, will sustain the incentive uh, program. So the, the funding that, um, that we've secured is for one year with the intention of obviously continuing this and the long-term intention for this to become something that I don't specifically have to manage, but that um, uh, a local person like Armand could eventually take over. Now, in terms of the incentives that I mentioned, and this was where I spent uh, a lot of time and discussed with many people um, about the delicacy, delicacy, the delicate nature of, of um, compensating in exchange for, for, for the data. Uh, initially, the intention was to have this be a voluntary participation um, with just some basic goods in exchange. But then uh, the more we reflected on this, the more it felt um, like uh, a good, good opportunity to, to uh, compensate people for taking part in this, in this research. Now, we are very uh, careful about managing expectations and we constantly reinforce that this is not a form of employment. It is uh, meant to be a bonus for participation and to keep motivation. So the salaries that are paid are paid to the BACA trackers, and those are trackers that are, in, that are core part of SPP research, and that will continue, and that's a different funding stream. CPMP funding will be specifically for these villages to maintain um, those, those, those cash incentives and the purchasing of food goods for up to a year. Thanks, Tessa. Um... Um, Chris, I think we had some other questions there. Chris, Chris are you there? Currently frozen, so will you uh, take Chris data, please? So, um, uh, I think um, Dave uh, Pepler and then I think Pete Apps had his hand up. Is that right, Pete? Did you have your hand up? Put your hand up if you had your hand up. So, Dave Pepler, will you? Do you have a question? Thanks, Tessa. I very much like your approach, your community-based approach. Uh, just two things. Um, whilst you have access to, to um, specimens, uh, do you look at viral loads, antibodies, etc.? It would be absolutely marvellous to find something completely deadly uh, in the pangolin, so one can throw that in the face of you-know-who. And the second point is I've spent um, some time in the Kalahari recently and on one 8,000 hectare farm, two pangolin were electrocuted in one month um, with the uh, fencing around the farms. Would you be interested in samples? Um, I've asked the farmers in the vicinity to freeze the carcasses. Right, so I will uh, note that I I'm speaking outside of my area expertise on this. Uh, Maya Gudehus, our former uh, program manager, is a trained vet, and she and Tam were really uh, managing that aspect of the research. Now, we don't actually receive or analyze the samples. The samples we are actually sending out 
to uh, to Sandy, for example, to their biobank. So um, no, don't send us your samples. We wouldn't be able to do anything with them. But um, the, as, as in terms of the viral loads, of course, you know, there's been some lots of traction on understanding, um, you know, the presence of of coronavirus in pangolins and um, you know, we, we can discuss that as well. But of course, I think that there's no doubt at this point that pangolins do carry the virus. It just might not be the virus that's led to the current pandemic. And um, it seems to be that the bottom line is that there's more research needed and um, more genetic analysis to be conducted. So I think it's really the start of a growing body of, of research on viral virology among pangolins. Dave, I think I can contact you tomorrow and you can chat about this. I can, I can figure a place for those penguins to go within country. Um, Pete Epps, did you have a question? You had your hand raised right in the beginning or was that just to shield yourself from the sun? I'm trying to unmute you, Pete. You have to accept. Yeah. If Hello, the hand Pete. was lifted, it was probably to get my wine glass to my lips. <laughs> I, I don't have a question at the moment. Thanks, Rod. Okay, Absalom, good to see you, my old friend. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Campbell Scott. Yes, ask to unmute. How are you doing, Campbell Scott? Hey, hi, guys. How's it, how's it Tessa? Great, Thanks, great talk. Um, I mean, we've, we've actually discussed this before, but I, I thought I'd just, you know, raise it again, is that, you know, especially having been to this area, and what's so unique about it is that it's so, you know, relatively untouched. I mean, it's really one of those last undiscovered places. But I suppose as, you know, as the trade increases, both, both ivory and, um, and with pangolins and what have you, is trying to understand how these networks actually infiltrate the communities, you know, and, and has there been any, you know, research knowledge or understanding of how this is coming about? I mean, so how does, you know, how, how, do, these, how do these syndicates come into these areas, you know? Um, you know, obviously we, we know a lot about, um, the, the, you know, the, the logging, you know, concessions coming in, putting in roads, you know, following that is the bushmeat trade. But, you know, on the, on the line of, on, you know, along that kind of train of thought, you know, are there, are there markers, are there flags that we should be aware of, you know, when, when we're looking at, you know, these, these areas in, in this kind of central Congo basin that are now becoming, you know, more and more accessible? Yeah, great, great uh, bringing up this point. Thanks. Well, um, so no, there have not been any formal studies, at least looking specifically at the Central African Republic, um, though, of course, there are groups that are looking at how these syndicates are operating, one of which is uh, within within DSPA. Um, what is what is known at this point is that there is convergence with the uh, pangolin scales being seized alongside ivory and, and uh, illegal arms. and um, and so uh, as one can only assume that as the value of pangolin scales increases, as it becomes a more profitable stream, it will uh, become more, more uh, present. And in fact, maybe even start uh, being a core part of the illegal market that's occurring in, in throughout the country. I mean, just uh, in February of this year, there was a, a seizure in Bangui of 500 kilos of, of giant pangolin scales, almost exclusively giant pangolin scales, which Maya in Bangui has been able to analyze. And um, this, as we know, you know, the seizure doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden the trade is occurring. It could just mean that because of law enforcement, we're now starting to intercept them. But it does show that there is, there is certainly uh, the Central African Republic is being used as a transit point from DRC uh, Congo onwards to Cameroon and Nigeria. Whether that becomes, it begins to become an important source country for pangolin scales uh, is something that, you know, um, in our small, small part at, SP, uh, at SPP within DSPA can contribute to that, but it's going to take collaboration with the, the parks throughout the country to, to really start uh, looking and analyzing um, 
these uh, these Ill illegal trade routes. And I suppose also, I mean, you're, you're, you're a hub of, you know, what, at least three countries that are, you know, stones throw away from each other. So that can't exactly help the situation either. So you need really cross-border uh, collaboration with, you know, anti-poaching, you know, police, um, you know, fighting crime and, and organized crime. So, you know, yeah. I mean, I can, I can imagine it's difficult. I mean, I must say I was encouraged when I was there that, you know, it largely seems untouched, but it, I'm certainly worried about the future, that's for sure. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Campbell. Thanks, Campbell. Uh, thanks. Any other questions? Um, and while I'm asking for questions, um, Marit, uh, you can uh, just set, do the settings so everybody can unmute themselves. Also see one or two names of people who know that region quite well, if you would like to make any comments from your side, uh, but at this point you can unmute yourself and go freely into discussion. So if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask your question. I would just like to um, come in here and say there's a few people on this uh, this talk tonight that I'd like to mention. Especially. It's um, uh, Julie Crane, Fulvia Mentor, and Elizabeth Uman. They have both been big support to, to Tessa in her time at the lodge. Um, if, uh, and, and yeah, especially Fulvia, because come back. most people sound, think Tessa is American, but Tessa is actually Italian. And uh, <laughs> Fulvia is also Italian, and they, they could hablo Italian together, and it was great. <laughs> Fulvia, how are you? Hi Rod, <laughs> so so good to for you. I'm really excited. I'm really <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your words. <laughs> you know that uh, I miss all. I miss the project and everything there. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Ciao, <laughs> Fulvia. Hi Tessa. How are you? <laughs> we speak anyway, <laughs> almost every day. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Thank you so much. And also, Julie. Julie, are you there? Yes, I am. Hey, hi. Hey, Julie. Thanks for ça your. Va? Oui, ça va bien. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's great uh, to Julie. hear forward and to have a. Uh, hope for the future of the project because everything is so frozen right now everywhere in the world. So it's great to here for mm. what we are waiting for in the next months. So yes, thanks Tessa, thanks Rod and Chris. Thank you. And Julie. Julie really took the project into onto the 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 um, the community project, the community involvement project, uh, uh, to to a completely different level, which is what Tessa said. She was so excited about it. It it, it Julie is the the driver of that and we, we're forever grateful for Julie. She's always welcome. And then of course, Elisabetta is, um, is related to Tessa and she visited us and she's a great, great person. Thank you, Elisabetta. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, I will Rod. say one thing about my, um, my mother actually came to visit, uh, Rod mentioned this as a guest at the lodge. And uh, this was right as we were conducting uh, these visits to Kunda Papai and where the idea was starting to form. And I have to say that, that when I arrived with my mother and we told the villagers that it was my mother, it had an immense impact because I think so rarely do people, uh, other than Rod and Tam and uh, their son alone, but the family dynamic for foreigners or Munjus that come, it really doesn't exist. Uh, I, I don't think often people come uh, other than the guests, but with their families. So it was really special to have my mother there. And I think it did leave a strong impression of commitment, which, um, yeah, just wanted to note that. 